welcome to Sharper Iron. Spend the next hour with us studying the living and active Word of God, His two-edged sword of law and gospel, recorded for you in Holy Scripture, all about Jesus Christ, crucified, risen, and ascended for you. Thanks for tuning in this morning here on Worldwide KFUO, Christ for you, anytime, anywhere. I am your host, Pastor Timothy Apple of Faith Lutheran Church in Godfrey, Illinois. Sharper Iron is underwritten by the Lutheran Church Extension Fund, where your investments help support the work of the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod. Visit lcef.org for more information. On this Friday, April 26th, we're studying Isaiah chapter 66, verses 1 to 6. In today's text, the Lord proclaims that He is the God who created and rules over heaven and earth, so that those who would come near to Him should not do so in ways of their own choosing, but rather should come in humility and in contrition, trembling at his word. To help us sharpen our faith in Christ as we study God's word today, we have with us Pastor Doug Minton. Pastor Minton serves at Our Savior Lutheran Church in Milford, Illinois. Pastor Minton, welcome back. Welcome to Sharp Iron. First time I've had Thank you. you. Glad to have I'm you. I'm glad today, to be Pastor here this morning. Doug. Yeah, fantastic. I understand you've been on a guest on KFUO before, but glad to have you on. Sharper Iron with us this morning to take a look at Isaiah 66, these first six verses. As I was considering the text for today, uh, Isaiah right here is one of those places where had he said amen at the end of chapter 65, I think the book would have wrapped up just just nicely after he has that vision of the new heaven and new earth. But much like St. John continues after he's told you the purpose of his book, he gives you a few more accounts, so Isaiah has a few more things to say. Uh, so with those things in mind, Pastor Men, talk to us about Isaiah, his context, what we need to know about the text we're going to look at today. All right, Isaiah is working through this time, which is about a century or so before Israel, the northern kingdom, is taken away, and about a century and a half or so before the southern kingdom, if I've got my dates right. Uh, I think he, he prophesies the northern kingdom falls during his ministry, but it is about a, about a century and a okay. half prior to the, the fall of the southern kingdom and the exile to Babylon, yep. Okay, so yeah, it's keep, keeping all the dates straight sometimes, especially this early in the morning, <laughs> kind of gets things. But he's prophesying about all of these things, and not only does he prophesy about the uh, exile into Babylon, but he talks about the things that come afterward which is one of the reasons why many of the church fathers have called Isaiah the fifth evangelist, is that he not only talks about the law and, you know, you need to straighten up, but here is God providing for you, which is why in the, uh, in the season of Advent, in preparation for Christmas, we have all of these Isaiah texts that we read. We think of all of these uh, passages throughout like Handel's Messiah, that is a lot of Isaiah in there. So Isaiah is a really important thing. And yes, if he would have just said amen at the end of 65, it would have been fine. But I, I also think it wraps up really nicely at the end of 66 as well. So it's, again, like John's gospel, it's like, all right, you know, here's one ending. Here's right. another ending. Yeah. <laughs> Which one do you want to pick? Uh, they're both fine. Yeah, well, we t we talked a little bit about in the the episode uh, on the end of chapter sixty five with the new heavens and the new earth, how that description of the new heavens and the new earth does point us toward the end of all things, and you can see the scriptures elsewhere picking up that same language from Isaiah sixty five to talk about the return of Christ and and eternal life and the resurrection. But at the same time, that language also gets used in some places in scripture to talk about our life within the church that as believers in Christ, we already dwell in the new heavens and the new earth by faith, so that what's described there does apply to us even now. And so perhaps, you know, of course, why did Isaiah keep writing? Well, the Lord had him keep writing. But perhaps part of what we see in that is the fact that this new heavens and new earth, though they do describe things that are to come in the future, it does impact our lives and our faith as Christians right now. It's not just something we're waiting for, kind of twiddling our thumbs. It makes a difference in the way that we live before the world and before the Lord, even today. Right. We have all of these things that this is what the Scripture is here for, is not just, okay, let's look at what is going to happen, and that's the only thing that matters, but okay, what does it mean for us here today? 
We're just a couple of weeks past the great eclipse that came through. And I don't know, that day I saw so many different posts on things and even saw a couple of clips of sermons talking about how this was the sign of the end of everything. Hmm. And I, well, we're still here. So That's right. it maybe not quite the end of all things yet. That's right. That's right. And so the Lord has more words for us as we continue to live in that hope, waiting for the new heavens and the new earth, rejoicing even now as we are a part of his church. And so we have that eternal life in Christ already now. So as we begin here in chapter 66, the Lord is going to describe where he dwells, what it means to approach him correctly. We're going to consider some some of the worship life of Israel and what that has to say about the way we would come before the Lord today and the way that we receive his word. Any kind of introductory thoughts on on this text from chapter 66 before we read it, Pastor Minton? Well, I think, you know, kicking back to the eclipse for a minute, it's just yet another one of those signs as he starts off this chapter, you know, you know, heaven is my throne, earth is my footstool. What is the house that you would build me? Yeah. I mean, I could... I've got all of this set up to do all of these things. What what exactly do you think you can do that's going to top that? Yeah, that's right. Okay, so he's going to declare himself to be the Lord of heaven and earth. What can you do for him? Not the things of your own choosing. Rather, come to him in the way that he has chosen. So we turn to Isaiah 66. This is beginning at the first verse. Thus says the Lord... Heaven is my throne, and the earth is my footstool. What is the house that you would build for me? And what is the place of my rest? All these things my hand has made, and so all these things came to be, declares the Lord. But this is the one to whom I will look, he who is humble and contrite in spirit and trembles at my word. He who slaughters an ox is like one who kills a man. He who sacrifices a lamb, like one who breaks a dog's neck. He who presents a grain offering, like one who offers pig's blood. He who makes a memorial offering of frankincense, like one who blesses an idol. These have chosen their own ways, and their soul delights in their abominations. I also will choose harsh treatment for them and bring their fears upon them. Because when I called, no one answered. When I spoke, they did not listen. But they did what was evil in my eyes, and chose that in which I did not delight. Hear the word of the Lord, you who tremble at his word. Your brothers who hate you and cast you out for my name's sake have said, Let the Lord be glorified, that we may see your joy. But it is they who shall be put to shame. The sound of an uproar from the city, a sound from the temple, the sound of the Lord, rendering recompense to his enemies. That is our text for today, Isaiah chapter 66, verses 1 to 6. Pastor Menton, at the beginning of our text, the Lord speaks. He calls heaven his throne and the earth his footstool. What is the Lord saying there? Well, God is saying that he is, once again, the creator of all things. Just as we finish chapter 65 with the new heavens and the new earth and the recreation of all things, So he reminds us that he can recreate because he is the one who created it all in the first place. And this is uh, one of the texts that Stephen actually quotes in his uh, big sermon in Acts 7, actually towards roughly the end of it. I think this is kind of where uh, the uh, Jewish leaders kind of get tweaked at him and start picking up the stones, is that he's you know, this upstart that nobody really knows there is trying to teach them. But honestly, as we go through even all of the scriptures, we see this again and again with heaven being called the throne of God, uh, whether we look at Revelation and seeing the great vision of chapter 4, where John is taken up into heaven in the spirit, and he sees the throne of God sitting there among all the multitude of the heavenly host. Or if we go earlier in Isaiah, where back in chapter 14, I believe he's talking to the king of Tyre at the time, but using it as a foil for 
uh, anyone who wants to try to set themselves up as God. And it's like, you know, you say in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. Above the stars of God, I will set my throne on high. This is kind of revamping that idea again as to if you if you want to get higher than me, if you want to get greater than I am, you have to ascend above heaven. Which yeah. there there is nothing above heaven. Which is why we have this whole idea of you know God being all powerful, because you know, if there was somebody who was more powerful than God, why are we still following following our God? Mm. Yeah, well, and, and so, okay, some of those, the connections, like to Isaiah 14, where you have the boasts of the, the king, I was thinking back into, like, chapter 47, where Babylon boasts, I am, there is no one besides me. Those who would, those who would claim these things are worshiping idols, and there's, a, there's definitely a condemnation of idolatry in the background of verse 1, which, to, to connect that to, to the way Stephen brings it up in Acts chapter 7, that's probably why when he brings it up, as you said, is at the end of his long sermon there, they start to get so mad at him at that point because he's basically accusing them of idolatry within the temple of the Lord. And while he's right, you can see why that would cause them to want to throw rocks at him. Exactly. When we get into uh, verse 3, we'll see that even a bit more as Isaiah takes the people of his time, but also of every time to task for the idolatry that we think, well, this is, this is what we're supposed to do. Yeah. Yeah. So, so the image then of the, of the heaven being the throne of, or heaven being the throne of God, something that the scriptures talk about in a lot of places, the earth being the footstool, then we have, I think uh, the picture of the King sitting on his throne and the footstool, whatever's under his feet is also under his reign and rule. So the, the Lord is saying, hey, I, I sit in heaven, but I reign over earth. It all belongs to me because I'm the one who created it all. So what do you think you can do from that to, to build me a place where I would, I would dwell? He's really putting the question to them. Right. We have, we have not only the image of rain, but also just the physical imagery of the footstool being the place where the feet rest so that everything is under his feet. So Psalm 99 says, exalt the Lord our God, worship at his footstool. Or uh, Jesus even says in the Sermon on the Mount, uh, you have heard it was said to those of old, you shall not swear falsely, but perform to the Lord what you have sworn. But I say to you, do not take an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not take an oath by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. Let what you say be simply yes or no. Anything more than this comes from evil. Go ahead. Keep going. We have this, we have this idea of, okay, this independent spirit that we have, partially from being Americans and having that whole still revolutionary idea of wanting to throw off huge establishment but also just from our sinful nature. It's like we think we can control our own destinies. We can do what we want. But Jesus reminds us that you can't make one hair of your head white or black. You can't keep the hair that's there from falling out. Again, the question comes back to, what are you going to do that makes me go, oh, well, I think I'll take up, I think I'll take up your offer. It's, it is quite the uh, quite the the challenge that the Lord lays before His people, which we've we've seen Him do this throughout, especially these these latter chapters of Isaiah, where He will challenge the idols or He'll challenge the idol worshippers. You go ahead and, and try this and see how it works for you. The way the way that Jesus brings it up there in the Sermon on the Mount, and He references this verse. It seems that what's going on there is that there are those who who would swear by the Lord's name if it's a really serious vow. But then perhaps for a less serious vow, they would just only swear by heaven or earth, and, and they would throw just swear. And Jesus says, look, all of this belongs to the Lord, so you're not really getting out of anything at all. Let your yes be yes, your no be no. Let God be God in heaven and on earth and rule over you. Do what you, are, you, you say you're going to do. Listen to his word in doing so. So the Lord makes it plain who he is. He is the one who rules 
from heaven. The earth is his footstool. And so then he asks the question, what is the house that you would build for me? And what is the place of my rest? Two questions, I suppose, put in parallel. Help us into the, the first one, the house that you would build for me. Well, as Isaiah is proclaiming his word in and around Jerusalem, there is the temple right there, the temple that Solomon had built. But if we go back to 2 Samuel 7, we see that the idea of building a temple didn't come from God. In fact, when David has this great idea of, well, wait, I dwell in a house of cedar, but the ark of God dwells in a tent. You know, this is kind of backwards. So I need to build him something great. And God comes back to Nathan in the dream that night and says, when have I ever asked for a house? What, what I, when I came to Moses and said, this is the dwelling that I'm going to have among the people, I picked a tent. You know, there's, I'm not saying, you know, I'm not wanting to uh, make myself established in just one place as all of it is mine. And I can move around as I wish, as the tabernacle did up until the time of Solomon building the temple. Mm. But what's, what's, oh, keep going. Sorry. Sorry. But the, the, the idea of a house for God on the earth was not. His I was not God's idea. You know, God wanted to be, as uh, Jesus talks to the Samaritan woman, worshiped in spirit and truth wherever it is we are. So here's I would I would try to clarify that a little bit, Pastor Minton, because I do think that the the Second Samuel seven text is very instructive because David comes to the Lord with the idea for the temple, and and Nathan even agrees with him at first. Hey, sounds great, David. Do what your heart has in front of you. But the Lord has to come and correct both of them and say, and I think this fits very well with the Isaiah text, why do you think that you get to choose how I'm going to dwell among you? You, you go ahead, you dwell in your palace, David, that's great. I've done all these great things for you, he tells him in 2 Samuel 7, but it's not your role to build me a house. I'm the one who builds the houses around here is pretty much what he, he tells David. And, and so the Lord... It is David's idea at that point. The Lord comes and tells David, you let me tell you when to build the temple. And David, it's not going to be your job. It is going to be your son's job, Solomon. He's going to build the name for my house. And of course, that points forward not only to what Solomon does in constructing an actual building, but it points forward even more in what our Lord Jesus does in taking on flesh, that temple that is destroyed, that he rebuilds in three days in his resurrection. So I do think, I mean, looking through the Old Testament, the, the tabernacle, the temple, these are God's ideas, uh, but they're God's ideas that he controls, that he commands, that are not to be taken into human hands and made into the things that we want them to be. That's where we run afoul of the, the gift that he's given. That's a very good point as well. And then when we get to, you know, what is the place of my rest? It's like, well, yeah, where where are we going to find a place for God to rest? I mean, we we have a hard time finding a place for us to rest, much less trying to figure out, okay, how do we get how do we get him to rest and to take a break from everything? Which is exactly what we don't want. Because when he takes a break from everything everything begins to fall apart. Hmm. So the uh, I would the uh, just to connect these two things a little more the the house that you would build for me. You mentioned the 2nd Samuel 7 passage. I think another another key passage in that regard is when Solomon does finish his temple in 1st Kings chapter 8 and he he prays at the dedication of it and he he marvels at this a little bit himself within that prayer. He, here's one example in 1 Kings 8, verse 27. He says, But will God indeed dwell on the earth? Behold, heaven and the highest heaven cannot contain you, how much less this house that I have built. But then in the very next verse, he says, Yet have regard to the prayer of your servant and to his plea, O Lord, listening to the cry and to the prayer that your servant prays before you this day, that your, day, your eyes may be open night and day toward this house, the place of which you have said, my name shall be there, that you may listen to the prayer that your servant offers toward this place. So Solomon marvels at this same idea and says, hey, look, Lord, 
what is this building that it could contain you? It can't. But, Lord, you have made your promise. You're going to be here in this place. So even though the building in and of itself really couldn't contain you, you've told us you're going to be contained here. So please listen when we pray to you here. And I think that that idea of the, the marveling that Solomon does there really points us forward to our Lord Jesus Christ, where, as, as you pointed out, you know, he says, those who worship God truly worship him in spirit and truth. They come to him through Jesus. If you want to go to the Father, the only way to him is to the Lord Jesus Christ. So, you know, what what could contain God? Well, well, nothing, I suppose, but he actually promises that he is found in certain places. And so when we go to those places, we can expect to find him. The trouble becomes, and this is what people are so good at, the trouble becomes is we we try to look for him in places he hasn't promised to be or to serve him in ways that he hasn't commanded. And that's when we run ourselves into to all kinds of trouble. We're going to see it in this text, and we can certainly see it throughout church history. Right. We have, we have that issue of not being the person that God says he wants in verse two, which is where I, which is where I had brought in, in, in my notes, Solomon at the oh, dedication. I'm sorry. Temple. I didn't right. mean to jump the gun on you. Tell no, us more about Solomon then. Because in verse two, we have God saying, I, all these things, my hand is made and all these things came to be. But this is the one to whom I will look. He who is humble and contrite in spirit and trembles at my word. Uh, we have a few chapters before in 1 Kings 3, we have Solomon's prayer uh, when God comes to him in the dream saying, what is it that you would like to have? And he's simply like, I need wisdom to rule this people of yours because he says, I'm, I'm young. I don't know all of these things. Uh, his name itself uh, is a derivative of the word shalom for peace. So he he is one who is humble and contrite. You know, he he trembles in that prayer at, you know, you, you know, the heavens cannot contain you, but yet you are allowing yourself to be in this building. Or later on when Jesus is walking the earth, it's, you know, you, the heavens cannot contain you, but you allow yourself to be contained inside a body. Yeah. You know, even more restrictive than the temple itself. But this is what Jesus, you know, and what Isaiah is talking about here is that that humbleness that we come before the Lord, re realizing that we are at His footstool. We are yeah. still, at best, at His feet groveling for everything that we can possibly get. And so that's what he is looking for, that person who is humble, who is willing to be contrite. As David says at the end of Psalm 51, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. This is, this is the one upon whom God, as the... As Augustine, in one of whatever uh, version of the Septuagint he's using in one of his sermons, talks about translating this verse as, on whom does my spirit rest? Mm -hmm. And turn, turns this whole, uh, the last part of verse 2 into a question uh, in that. But it's the one who is contrite, the one who realizes his own place in the world and in the grand scheme of all of creation. Because we ourselves can do nothing. We are the ones who have to rely on him. Which is why he focuses on us when we hype ourselves up and puff ourselves up, thinking that we're something. It's like, wait, you know, I'm the one who created all these things. You know, he said it in verse 1. He says it again here in verse 2. It's like, again, who are you? Hopefully you are one who is contrite and humble, realizing where you stand in the pecking order of creation. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, I think that I think it's helpful to, to see the, the, again, the reference to creation in this verse again, and, and where we stand in that creation. We are the those whom God has created, 
always receiving from him, never presuming upon him, always coming before him as our creator. And that's that's humility, that's contrition, because we're sinners, that's the trembling at his word. And I wonder if the, just to, to go back very briefly to the place of rest that the Lord asks about in the, the first verse, I wonder if that's maybe how the, the place of rest fits in, thinking about creation, the Lord creates everything in six days, and then on the seventh day he rests, which you know it doesn't mean that he took a nap or something like that, but he, he's done created. He he finishes, and and still the world doesn't fall apart. You know, I mean the the Lord the Lord even in his rest, I suppose, is at work sustaining. And so you know, what's the place of my rest? Are, are you really? Do you think you need to build me a place to take a nap? I I rested. I didn't do anything on the on the seventh day. I did not create. I rested. And, and I still remain your creator. So who do you think you are to, to come before me with all these works of your hands? Rather, instead, receive the work of my hands, the Lord would say, in creation, in that day of rest. I think that if, if that's what's in view there with the day of rest, that, that speaks to like the way Jesus talks, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Right? The, the man wasn't made so that he could do all these things for the Lord on the Sabbath because the Lord couldn't do them himself. No, the Lord gave Sabbath as rest for man, because he has his place of rest, uh, and and that's that's not to for us to serve him, but it's actually for for him to serve us. I don't know. That's kind of a rambling thought, but maybe some of it helped. But no, it's a it's a very good way of bringing it all in too, because Augustine also uh, takes these words and says, "At these words, Peter trembled. Plato did not. So let the fishermen keep what the great and famous philosopher ignored." And then he quotes from Matthew 11, you have hidden these things from the wise and the knowing and have revealed them to little ones. Because we think, you know, from our perspective, okay, Plato, the great philosopher, okay, you know, very smart man. Who does Jesus pick for his disciples? Peter, the fisherman. Yeah. But, you know, despite Peter having foot and mouth syndrome quite often, he, he is still one who, is humble and contrite. You know, he he trembles at the word when it's there. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. I I had written down Peter as one of the, the examples in, in mine in my notes as well, that when when Jesus gives that miraculous catch of fish, he says, Depart from me, Lord, I am a sinful man. He trembles at the word of Jesus. Yet Jesus bids him rise and says that Peter will be a fisher of men. That's a good place to take our break as we think about trembling at the word of God. We'll come back and look at more of this text from Isaiah 66 on the other side. You're listening to Sharper Iron on KFUO. We're talking to Pastor Doug Menton this morning. We'll be right back. Please stick around. Lutheran Church Extension Fund exists to support Lutheran Church Missouri Synod Ministries and church workers. How do we do this? Your investment with LCEF makes it possible for LCMS churches, schools, organizations, and church workers to receive low-cost loans for new and growing ministries. And faithful Lutherans like you, church members and church workers alike, make that possible when you invest with LCEF. Learn more at lcef.org. LCF is a nonprofit religious organization. Therefore, LCF investments are not FDIC insured bank deposit accounts. This is not an offer to sell investments or solicitation to buy. LCF will offer and sell its securities only in states where authorized. The offer is made solely by LCF's offering circular. Investors should carefully read the offering circular, which more fully describes associated risks. Welcome back to Sharper Iron. It is Friday, April 26th. We're studying Isaiah chapter 66, verses 1 to 6, with Pastor Doug Menton. He serves at Our Savior Lutheran Church in Milford, Illinois. Pastor Menton, prior to the break, we were talking about verse 2. The one upon the the one upon whom the Lord looks is the one who's humble, who's contrite in spirit, and who trembles at the Lord's word. You had mentioned St. Peter as a great example of that. I had also thought of the prophet Isaiah himself. In his call scene in Isaiah 6, he sees the, the seraphim flying around in the, the heavenly throne room. He hears them singing the Sanctus, that the Lord is holy, 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 and the whole earth is full of his glory. 
And Isaiah, upon hearing this word of the Lord, he trembles and says, woe is me. thought he was another good example of someone who trembles at the Lord's word. Yeah, Isaiah himself is one of those because he, he goes on s- several times throughout the prophecy to kind of lean back to chapter 6. But one of them uh, was Isaiah 57, uh, verse 15, where thus says the one who is high and lifted up, who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place, and also with him who is of a contrite and lowly spirit, to revive the spirit of the lowly, and to revive the heart of the contrite. Now, we we typically want to take trembling as that you know, real fear, like horror movie style trembling. But this is, you know, that woe is me kind of trembling that, you know, if it were not for the fact that uh, God has not smitten me from what I have seen and what he has told me, I wouldn't be here. Mm-hmm. You know, he, he is the one who is there to revive the spirit of the lowly and the heart of the contrite, to bring about the one who truly seeks to worship him as he desires to be worshiped. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Just to, real briefly, uh, before we move on, as reflecting on these verses, the first two verses for our lives as Christians today, especially with that connection to Isaiah 6, we sing those words as a part of our communion liturgy, as a part of the Sanctus. So holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts. Heaven and earth are full of his glory. And then we connect that to the song of the crowds from Palm Sunday. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Here, this one who fills heaven and earth with his glory now comes in great humility. And so what a what a wonderful thing to consider as we approach the altar every time we receive the Lord's Supper that we would do so in humility and contrition, trembling at the Lord's word, knowing that this one who has all authority in heaven and on earth and fills fills all creation and made all things, now chooses some of the most humblest elements of his creation, bread and wine, in order to deliver himself to us. I think these these verses help us to, to wonder and to meditate upon what happens in the Lord's Supper. Exactly, because we have this... This is where we, in our daily lives, come trembling, uh, which is why in many of our churches, we have communion rails to kneel uh, as a sign of reverence, but also just for the fact that, you know, as we just sung in the Sanctus, you know, holy, 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 blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And now this Lord is coming to us in that bread and wine. Sometimes I wonder if, you know, God inspired the people who came up with the communion rail idea to begin with. It's like, you know, you, you need a place for the people to hang on to that, you know, in, in that trembling, because here we are in, in the app, not only the presence of God as we are throughout the worship service, but here is God coming to us. You know, we talked about confining himself to the temple and confining himself to the body, but then yes, you brought it up, you know, confining him now to bread and wine. You know, it's just, it's mind blowing. We can't we can't fathom it. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And and we can't fathom it. And I think that's part of the point with with Isaiah here is that yeah, we, we wouldn't have come up with this if, if we were going to design a way to worship the Lord. Probably eating bread and drinking wine is not the way we would have come up with. We would have thought of something much fancier or more more spiritual looking. But the Lord says, this is truly spiritual, this is true religion, because I'm giving it to you. It's my choice for you. Receive it as a gift. Don't choose something for yourself and then offer it to me as if you're doing something for me. And I think that that thought that's certainly there in the first two verses becomes more plain as we see it played out in verses 3 and 4 especially, where we see this this self-chosen worship side by side with the the worship that the Lord had said, and it seems that the people are are trying to do them together or consider them equal in some way, or or their heart isn't in their their acts of worship that the Lord has given. So we've got these the sacrificial language on the one hand that seems good, combined with things that we know are definitely bad. Take us into some of these comparisons, these different ways of of worship that are going on in verse three. Well, this is where, and looking through some of my commentaries, I found a great divide 
and the way people took this. Uh, many, it's you know the idea of our own self-made ideas for worship, and how you know we we think you know we we would make things you know more grandiose than what God has given to us. And others said, well, this is showing that you know God is condemning just dry ritual, you know, and dead ritual, which, of course, a couple of these commentators are also the ones who would say the liturgy is dead ritual. So we need to figure out our own way of doing worship because he's like, okay, you know, an ox, the great, you know, the greatest of the animals that were offered as sacrifice in the Levitical system, you know, I, you know, God is here comparing to human sacrifice, which is an abomination. Uh, the lamb, which comes about over and over again, is like sacrificing a dog, which a couple of the commentaries said that was part of some idol worship in the Middle East in the, in the Old Testament era. And it's like, okay, we, th we think of dogs and, you know, the ones that come sit in our lap, whether they're 10 pounds or 100 pounds, right. and, you know, just just want to be petted and loved on or no these are these are the scavenger dogs that are you know running through the trash heap uh that are being talked about here or the grain offering uh being like pig's blood which pigs being an unclean animal as well and all of these things it's like okay what what are we to make of all of this and it's simply the idea of you know doing it with the wrong intentions, doing it with the wrong heart, not one that is contrite and broken and humble, but one that is here, God, this is here, here is my gift to you. Now, you now be happy about it. Uh, uh, whereas we uh, bring in the third commandment here as to really all of it comes down to our natural desire to despise the word. You know, we, we think the word is just too simple. Although, you know, we're, we're sitting here 30 minutes into a discussion of three verses of Isaiah and calling it simple. But it's, you know, the, the despising of the word that Luther says that we should not do based on the third commandment is here because we want things to be greater. We want things to be more of a show, which is one of the issues that like the big mega churches have, that they they have this idea that we have to do something greater this week than we did last week. And it's always got to be building up to bigger and bigger things. Whereas confessional Lutherans come and say, okay, all of that is fine. You want to have your smoke uh, machines, you want to have your laser lights, fine, whatever. We here have what God has told us to do. We're not going much further than that, but you know we have, you know we have what where he has promised to to be found. Whereas, you know, in all of that other stuff and all of the show, Jesus might be there, but a lot of times he just gets an honorable mention. A lot of times, mm -hmm. yeah. What what is it that that guarantees that the Lord will be there in your worship? It's his command and promise. It's not the emotions that you build up. It's not the show that you put on. It's not the outward trappings of things. The, it's always the command and promise of the Lord Jesus. That is how you know that he is present in your worship and delights in it and receives it. And, and to what's going on here in Isaiah 66, verse 3, the, as you were describing it, it reminds me a little bit of, of the way that the prophet speaks in Isaiah chapter 29, which Jesus brings up against the Pharisees, where the, the Lord says, the because this people drew near with their mouth and honor me with their lips while their hearts are far from me, and their fear of me is a commandment taught by men, and he goes on to, to say what he's going to do, but that's it sounds like the attitude that's going on here, that the one who slaughters the ox or sacrifices the lamb or presents a grain offering, or makes a memorial offering of frankincense, which are things that the Lord gave his people to do in the law, they do it with a heart that's far from the Lord, 
And so the Lord does not receive those actions because that worship is not done in faith. When the worship is done in faith, the Lord delights in it. But here the people are not doing it in faith, it seems. And so they may as well be doing these abominations that are going on. The, the killing of a man, the breaking the dog's neck, the offering the pig's blood, and the, the blessing an idol. When you do your worship outwardly and there's no faith, then you, you may as well be engaging in idol worship. Uh, Dr. Lessing, in his commentary, just to throw one more thought out there, which I because I, 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 I know there's a, a bit of a disagreement sometimes about what this verse precisely means, he suggests that the, the Hebrew syntax actually allows for these things rather than to be a comparison, so the one who slaughters an ox like the one who kills the man, he says that the Hebrew syntax allows for those two to be the same person. So the one who slaughters an ox is the one who kills the man. The one who sacrifices the lamb is the one who breaks the dog's neck. So that it wouldn't be the, the hypocritical worship that's being condemned, but what would we, we would call it the syncretistic worship. So on the one hand, they're going to the Lord's temple, and then they're going over the temple of Dagon and Baal and whatever god you, you got down the street, they're doing both. Whichever one's going on, this is clearly not something that the people of God want to be engaged in. Right. We have that, again, you know, there are, there are a few different ways of taking these verses, but and we have it throughout all of uh, Jewish history in the Old Testament, is that you've got the people all the Sabbath worshiping Yahweh, but then, you know, the other days of the week, you know, they're wherever. You know, they're worshiping in another temple of another god, or they're up on the high places with Baal and Asherah and all of that. And they're like, you know, it's no big deal. It's yeah. like, you know, we can do both of these things. But then Paul takes the Corinthians to task about the very same thing. Uh, when, you know, they ask the question about food sacrifice to idols. It's like, well, if, if you have faith, the only meat you're going to get is from the market that has the leftovers from the sacrifices from the idol temples. But if you know that sacrifice is nothing, then go ahead and eat it. But if you stumble because, okay, this was offered to Apollo or, you know, whatever other Greek or Roman god, you're like, you know, then don't. You, know, it, you, you can't do both. Yeah. You, yeah, you, you can't, have to pick you... one or the other. That's right. As, as he says toward the end of that discussion in chapter 10, you can't participate in both the table of demons and the table of the Lord. You can't drink from the cup of demons and the cup of the Lord. And again, that, that syncretistic worship is certainly a problem for the people of Israel, as well as the hypocritical worship. They both go on together. Maybe the, the way to summarize this is the way that Isaiah does at the end of verse 3. These have chosen their own ways. And so, I mean, you know, we look at the things that are going on here, and we can see that they're pretty obviously wrong. Murder, breaking a dog's neck, offering pig's blood, blessing an idol. You, you look at the Old Testament, you know those are, are obviously wrong. But he, the reason they're wrong is because these are ways of worship according to the people's own choosing, rather than according to the way the Lord has given them to worship. And because they're worshiping, according to their own choosing, the Lord says, hey, you're just delighting in abominations here. Exactly. And so God goes on in verse 4 to say, okay, this is what's going to happen because of them choosing their own way. Uh, Jesus picks it up in Matthew 22 as he's talking about the kingdom of heaven, that it may be compared to a man who gave a wedding feast for his son and sent his servants to call those who were invited to the feast, but they would not come. Again, he sent other servants, you know, saying, you know, everything's ready. Come to the feast. And they paid no attention. One went off to his farm, another to his business, while the rest seized his servants, treated them shamefully, and killed them. So the king was angry and sent his troops and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. So really, what God is talking about here is that the I will choose harsh treatment for them and bring fears upon them. Because when I called, no one answered. When I spoke, no one listened. We're all too wrapped up in our own ideas and our own thoughts that when the Lord calls to us, a lot of times we don't hear. We don't realize it until afterwards when you know things work out exactly the way we were hoping they wouldn't. 
Yeah, I mean, this is a pretty strong condemnation that is found for those people who have chosen their own ways in verse 4. There's, I think, a a bit of a play between 3 and 4. They've chosen, so now the Lord chooses this. And it is, it's a rather heartbreaking thing when you you consider all that the Lord has done. He called, he spoke, they didn't answer, they didn't listen. In the in the previous chapter, he says, I was ready to be sought by those who weren't asking for me, to be found by those who didn't seek seek him. He was saying, Here am I, here am I. I mean, he's he's even said all the way back in chapter 55, seek the Lord while he may be found. He is right here calling out and speaking, and they're not answering, which makes the the situation for these self the self-directed worshipers that it makes it all the more heartbreaking because the Lord is right there speaking to them, giving them his word as a gift, free and clear, and they choose something else. And it is such a heartbreaking thing to watch when that happens, certainly in Isaiah's day, in Jesus' own day as he weeps over Jerusalem, and still today as as people reject the free gift of God's grace in his word. Right. And when Jesus is talking with the Pharisees you know, the and the scribes and the elders of the people, the ones who are supposed to know the scriptures the best among everybody. And he's like, you don't get it yet, do you? You know, I keep calling, uh, you know, the weeping over Jerusalem. How many times I would have gathered you together like a ch- like a hen gathers her chicks together. How many times? But you wouldn't listen. So, yes, you know, the bad things are going to happen because we choose to not listen. We choose to not follow. As Isaiah finishes up there, you know, they did what was evil in my eyes and chose that in which I did not delight. You know, this is this is our choice as sinful human beings, is that we want to do the things that God considers evil. Sometimes simply because God considers them evil. Mm. And we want we want kind of God to prove himself. Well, here here is the promise that he's going to. You know, the harsh treatment for them, you know, to bring, bring the fears upon them. Uh, you, you have very few options in this time where God says, okay, I'm going to give you harsh treatment. And then, you know, see, see how you like that, whether it's exile into Babylon or Assyria, or it's, you know, our own, uh, uh, the fallout of our own sinfulness or, hell itself at the end, where it's like, now what are you going to do? Yeah. So to those who, who are listening now, to you and to me, the, the call remains from Isaiah 55, seek the Lord while he may be found. He is speaking right now. Today is the day of grace, the day of salvation. Repent and believe in the gospel. And and so as, as the prophet concludes this section in verses 5 and 6, he speaks the word of the Lord now to those who tremble at his word. So verses 3 and 4 speak about those who are engaging in self-chosen worship. Now verse 5 returns, and the Lord speaks not about, but he speaks to those who we were mentioning in verse 2, the humble, the contrite, and especially the trembling at his word. And it sounds like he's, he's talking about, hey, these idolaters, they may persecute you, but have no fear the Lord will bring about his justice in his time. Help us into some of the, the details there in verses 5 and 6, the Lord's word to those who tremble at his word. Well, one of the first thing that popped into my mind when I saw it, you know, getting into verse 5, is your brothers who hate you. It's like my first thought was Joseph. But then I kept reading the verse, and it's like, you know, and cast you out for my name's sake. It's not exactly the reason why the older brothers got rid of Joseph. <laughs> but it does it does go more to the end of the beatitudes blessed are those blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake for theirs is the kingdom of heaven blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account rejoice and be glad for your reward is great in heaven for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you you know pe- people want to say in especially in their self-directed ideas as, you know, I'm doing this for the Lord. I mean, Saul himself, when he's recounting his conversion experiences in the later chapters of Acts, talking about, I thought I was doing the Lord a good thing. 
You know, I thought I was doing a good thing persecuting these Christians. I was trying to let the Lord be glorified. But yeah, I got the harsh treatment. You know, granted, you know, you know, thankfully for Paul, it was three days of blindness and then, you know, a kind of a rough life as a missionary for the church, but you know, it still could have been a lot worse had he kept going with the way he wanted. But he he wanted to see and follow God more than anything else. I mean, Paul is one of those who is contrite. He is one who trembles at God's word, seeking simply to do what is expected of him. But even then he goes back, he can go back to Jesus saying, you know, and when you have done all things, you know, say we are unworthy servants. We've only done that which was commanded. And so we hear this great word that, you know, they want to put you to shame because you don't do things the way they want, but it's they who are going to be put to shame in the end. Yeah. And this is when we get to verse six and the, the end of it, the sound of the Lord rendering recompense to his enemies. Hmm. As uh, he says in Deuteronomy 32, vengeance is mine and recompense for the time when their foot shall slip, for the day of their calamity is at hand and their doom comes swiftly. Or Jesus' last words in the New Testament in Revelation 22, behold, I am coming soon, bringing my recompense with me. Yeah. You know, yeah. We have, we we think, okay, you know, you know, they have, they have the bigger crowds and all of this and, you know, all, all of these great things that we think, okay, the, the that's got to be working for them. But then they find out, yeah, there's actually nothing there. I mean, the smoke machines are not the only thing blowing smoke. I, I appreciate the, the reference to the Beatitudes, I think is really helpful. And you, how you see this play out in the lives of the faithful throughout the, the centuries. Uh, listening to the, the mockery that comes from those who are, are doing the casting out, you know, let the Lord be glorified that we may see your joy reminds me a lot of the mockery that Jesus received on the cross. You know, come down, let the Lord save him if the Lord loves him. That sort of mockery. Well, at the, at the death of Jesus, we see already the vindication of Jesus. And I think, you know, thinking just in verse 6, the sound that comes from the temple. So you have the temple curtain tearing, which certainly made a, a, an enormous sound that already in that miraculous event at the death of Jesus, you see... Uh, that the Lord is vindicating his son already, which is uh, fulfilled and completed then on the third day in the resurrection, giving us all hope who are in Christ that right now, even as the world persecutes us and there may be trouble, the Lord will, he, he does justify us now and he will vindicate us on the last day and he will take us into the resurrection and, and that will make it all worth it, if I can say it that way, that that this is the, the true faith. The Lord will prove himself and his word to be true. Got about a minute left here, Pastor Minton. Help us to, to wrap things up on this section of Isaiah 66 this morning. Basically, Isaiah is saying, you know, the Lord through him, listen to me. I'm the one who knows what I'm talking about. You have a limited perspective of things. Going back to verse one, heaven is my throne, the earth is my footstool, and you inhabit just a little section of that footstool. Remember your place. And that is the one who is contrite, the one who is humble, trembling at the word of the Lord, because truly the word of the Lord is the one that made us, the one that sustains us, the one who has saved us, and the one who is going to in the end, raise us. And that Master, is the great uproar from the city, the sound of the temple, the Lord rendering recompense to his enemies. Pastor Doug Minton serves at Our Savior Lutheran Church in Milford, Illinois. He has been helping us today to study Isaiah chapter 66, verses 1 to 6. Pastor Minton, thanks for being our guest today. Thank you for having me. I am your host here on Sharper Iron, Pastor Timothy Apple of Faith Lutheran Church in Godfrey, Illinois. If you have any questions about Isaiah 66, send an email to kfuo at kfuo.org. It is always a joy to hear from you. 
Beginning of next week, we will push farther into Isaiah 66 and hear more of the Lord's word to his people. Thanks for spending the morning with us today. Talk to you again next week. Showing support for KFUO is now easier than ever. You can sport a KFUO shirt, swag, or even socks by visiting our online store. Go to kfuo.org slash store and order high-quality KFUO-branded merch. You no longer need to wait for our annual share for a chance to show your KFUO spirit. Visually share and wear this ministry out in the world by checking out our selection. Every purchase helps to support our proclamation of Christ for you, anytime, anywhere. Go to kfuo.org slash store.